what are you doing this? What are you doing this for? It doesn't bother me, right? It, yeah. it, it's just like, I know what my, my North Star is. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And no amount of dissuasion or you know commentary from anywhere else is gonna is gonna put me off that because i'm i truly am locked into the belief of what i'm doing thing. this is a deep question okay you ready for this, this what's the one thing this thing that's miserable yeah and i'm just sitting there thinking hold on a minute. I think the thing that's not really said but i think the thing that nearly everybody wants is to get to know themselves on a deeper level but why do i still have that feeling inside my stomach telling me that something's not right and you're not you're not happy. Resonate. And maybe for some people, that moment isn't about accumulating wealth. Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it was a relationship that you're in and you realise that this isn't what you actually wanted. Something... I've never actually said this to anyone. Um, and there's only you here, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm still buzzing from today, mate. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Every time we connect and work together, it's like turbo charges the production and um, very very grateful for you yeah no and um, thank you for coming here today because i know we had normally i come down to you and today because of child care and all sorts of logistical issues and, and you made it down here so i'm glad we did because we got to do this and normally we wouldn't get to do this so um yeah very grateful absolutely and like i said to you as soon as i walked in your house at like what 9 a.m this morning that it just has such a good energy in the house and uh, yeah i think that's testament to both you and nisha and the little genius liliana as well which we haven't spoken about on the pod that much i don't imagine no. um so what are you most excited about sanjay over these next few days weeks and months new baby <laughs> i had to say that first just that I, no but i had to say that first yeah, yeah. just so it was you know, someone's like, hold on a minute, you're having a baby. Like, oh, yeah. So baby, for sure. Exciting. Very exciting. Um, what else am I excited about? Um, I'm excited about um, I'm excited about the work we're doing together. Mm -hmm. It's really, really rewarding and fulfilling. And I think it's just, it's amazing. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm just generally excited. I think this last, I was talking to, well, I was talking to you about it just yeah, earlier yeah. today. It's just yeah. the last six months has just been so huge in terms of, um, lots of things going on, transformations, just realizations, just things not, uh, falling into place seems like, oh, everything's perfect, but just things starting to click and starting to, I'm starting to, okay, right now I see where this is going. And I think so that's quite exciting when that starts to come together. And you know this from putting together your 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 programs and your um, your courses. It's, it's nice when you start seeing things piecing together. Uh, 100%. And you know, earlier today, I read something about clarity and clarity doesn't just come from thinking, but it comes from acting. Mm. And so I think that what you're talking about with the pieces falling into place is a sign of a moment of clarity, right? Yes. But we met, we met oh, ages ago now. If you think back, it's probably two years that we just under two years that we connected, probably in the, in the middle of the pandemic. I think it was at the start, percent, potentially. Yeah, 2020 not, for sure. 2020, yeah, yeah. for sure, yeah. And... Even then when we met, I knew that we were going to be friends. But gosh, there's been so much change in both of our lives in that time period. There's been house moves on your part. Um, there's been the pregnancies on both parts. There's been changes in career. What would you say in the last few years has been your biggest lesson? And and what I mean by that is what's been the kind of the the biggest aha for you the biggest moment of of clarity over these last few years i've been thinking about that question a lot because lots of people have asked me that question recently <laughs> <laughs> which means i'm hanging around with some really cool people that ask me that question so um i think it's 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 clear to me what that is i think the the biggest aha moment for me has been the realization that i am my biggest obstacle when it comes to achieving my goals and dreams. And once that kind of sort of settled and I was able to understand what that actually meant, um, it was like, oh, really? And it's literally like someone just cleared, like, I don't wear glasses, but I'd imagine it's like, you know, on a foggy day or you know, hot day, just clearing your glasses, like, mm. oh, I can see now. Mm. And I think that has been the number one thing because once you lift that lid off, then the, the potential is unlimited. Yes. And, and that's kind of how 
It sounds strange to say, but that's kind of how it feels. It's quite liberating. I, I completely hear you on that. What basically what you're saying is you have this massive shift in beliefs in this in this time period. And you said that you're the obstacle of your own problems, but actually that's an empowering thing. And I get that. Let's talk about the beliefs that you used to have a long time ago, because I know there'll be people on the podcast, listening to the podcast, that you're going to share some of these stories and they're going to hear some of themselves in you. I know I definitely resonate with a lot of your stories. So maybe share a story in the past where the beliefs were a little different than how they are now. Oh, gosh. Um, what story can I share that the, the beliefs... I think uh, there's, lots of, there's lots of times I'm, I can kind of talk about it in, in a sense that I look back now and I think of things that I've tried to do in my life in the past mm. and where I might have... You know, when I was a kid, I got into playing the keyboards mm. and I wanted to play the drums. And then I wanted to, you know, you kind of get in, you, you kind of dabbling with all these things. And then when you get, when you get older and you still are interested in all these different things, you're just being curious, right? It's just, right. And I, I feel like I was a very, I was a very curious child. And I think I feel like I'm a very curious adult as well. And, but earlier on in my life, those curiosities, you kind of, you 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 feel like oh this is what I, I really want to do this right I, I, music is it's music for example right yeah. when I was a child I was like I really really want to learn a musical instrument because I love music so much yeah yeah and then you know people talk and they say you know oh you know you don't want to wait but waste bother time with music and you don't want to waste time with this and you don't mm. want to do that what, why are you going to do that what's it, what's what you're going to get out of it and then you start listening to those voices and right then those voices are the ones that you start hearing yourself it's like oh no but what what are you why are you bothering with this mm. but then there were certain things like for me like music for example i didn't learn an instrument i was like well and and i tried to learn an instrument and i just felt I don't know, I was very, I felt very out of place. I couldn't read music. You know, I tried to learn to read music as a kid. And I was like, wow, this is really hard. Mm. You know, reading notes and trying to figure it out. So, yeah. so yeah. I played drums because drums, I felt like you could just play by feel. And whether that's true or not, I feel like I did. I did it. I played it by feel. And then I got into DJing. So, but I, so I all, I still followed that path, even though people were telling me not to. And I kind of found my own way within that path. But even then it's kind of like, you know, there's, it's, it's the, it's, I said, I'm my biggest obstacle. Other people kind of put those thoughts in your head and then you start to believe that, that narrative. Absolutely. And that for me is an example of, and, and there's moments like that. I mean, that's a really simple example of from, from childhood. Mm -hmm. There's been moments like that throughout my career where I felt, oh, I really want to go and I want to go and do this. And then someone will come in and say, actually, there's a really good story. Um, when I, when I was 18, just did my A-levels, and I didn't get the grades that I should, I wanted to get to go and do sports science, mm -hmm. which is, was, again, that was another thing I was doing. I was doing PE and physiology and sports. And it was like, oh, what are you doing that for? You know, who, who does that? What's PE, <laughs> what are you doing in PE A level? <laughs> um, but I still did it. And then I didn't get the grades that I wanted to get to do exercise science. And I actually wanted to be a sports physiotherapist. That was kind of like the, the trajectory that I kind of saw myself. And then I remember, um, I already had this part-time job working in the city and it was through a friend of my father's who, who gave me this job. He was the CEO of this company. And when it came to choosing whether I go to university or not, you know, he was my father. Everyone wanted me to go to university. He, he was like, he was a kind of mentor to me as well, but because he was friends with my dad, it was kind of like he'd talk to my dad and you know, he'd come and talk to me at work. And he said, look, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to be a physio. He's like, right, I've got a friend who's who's a physio and I want, I'm going to set up a meeting with you and I want you to talk to him. So I met this this guy and, you know, who's an experienced physio and he came to talk to me and he sat down and we had a chat. And this guy, he literally put me off becoming a physiotherapist. Yes. <laughs> and I was sitting there thinking, but you're a physio. Yeah. And he's just, I, I can't, I don't remember the exact conversation, but I do remember coming out of the conversation going, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, do you know what I mean? It was just a simple one. It was a conversation that I had with one person. Yeah. And that if that was a research project, you would be you'd be thrown away, right? You can't just have a, a, yeah. a, a, a audience of one. But I, I bought it and I was like, actually, you know what? This You're probably right. And I started, you know, believing it. And then I was thinking, well, what do I go and do then? You know, do I just go to university for the sake of it? Um, which I just felt I was really against that. For, to me, just 
going to uni just to go to uni yeah. because that's the thing to do. I was just something within my fabric didn't didn't it didn't sit well. So anyway, I kind of procrastinated a little bit and um, I ended up going last minute through clearing. Um, and um, I got a place in Westminster University doing computer science, right? Which, again, I'm in into technology. I'm into IT, into computers. I mean, computer science in 1997 is a lot different to computer science in Absolutely. 2022. But there was an interest there. But when again, when I did it, I went into the classes as learning to program C++ and all this code and stuff. And I was like, this is not me. And again, it just, that feeling in my stomach was just telling me, this is not you. This is not what you're meant to do. So I give I gave that up and I quit and I was like right I've got to do something now and fortunately for me or unfortunately however you want to look at it, actually fortunately um, the the where I was working they offered me a job and said look you've always got a job here right if you want a job and I was like really and I'm like yeah you can come and work here and you've been working here for a couple of years already yeah. so it was kind of like at the time I felt like well this was meant to be yeah right I yeah. I didn't get the grades um, someone put me off. Um, going to physio, um, uh, I, I've tried to go to university and it didn't work. I, I, I wouldn't say I failed. I decided not to pursue it. Sure. And now I've got a job. What, what more do you want? This is, isn't the point of going to university to get a good job? Right. Well, I've right. already got a good job sitting here and I was getting paid a lot of money for the time. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, why, why would you not do this? So I was like, well, I'll just, I've just skipped. I've just kind of fast forwarded. I've just skipped the uni part and I've already got myself a job. So, Amazing. but the point is that that conversation ch completely changed the trajectory of, of my, my thinking. Yes. And I don't, I don't regret what the actions I took because I truly believe that I'm here today because of everything that's happened in the past and every step that I've taken. But that's an example of how, you know, my thinking would be different. Whereas now, I think if now someone came to me and, and people do say this, you know, well, you know as, oh, why are you doing this? What are you doing this for? It doesn't bother me, right? It, yeah. it, it's just like, I know what my my North Star is. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And no amount of dissuasion or, you know, commentary from anywhere else is going to is gonna put me off that because I'm, I truly am locked into the belief of what I'm doing. Whereas then I thought I knew, and I think I did, because it's no, it's no coincidence that I've come back around and I'm still kind of, I'm not a physio, but I'm, I'm working in that realm or I have been working in that yeah. realm of healthcare, wellness, coaching, PT, you know, in rehabilitation, all that stuff. So yeah, it's just that, that I think I'm, I, it's an example of where I would have, I would have been easily swayed. And I think a little bit of that was people pleasing. Yes. And we, we can, we can talk about this, but actually I, I'm going to pick up on some amazing points. Essentially what you said is that you were very influenceable back then and you were highly influenced by a physio saying that it wasn't a good idea and potentially that was a very useful thing for you but then that led you to kind of find your path in something that was a bit more aligned to who you thought you were at that time through the computer science course through the various things and there's two points i've got to pick up on so the first thing is in order to influence which is what you're doing right now on a podcast you must first be influenceable it's from you know stephen covey great book and again in Stephen Covey he beautifully shows that how we go through emotional maturity so for anyone who I'm sure loads of people know Stephen Covey he's, he's written the seven habits of highly effective people it's an aid old book that my mum <laughs> re read 20 years ago but he speaks about how in emotional maturity we go from we go from feeling uh, dependent to inter independent and then finally interdependence and dependent is when we're reactive to other people's opinions, other people's beliefs. And as a child, well, of course, like that. Um, so you, what you're describing is this beautiful journey to responsibility, from reactivity to responsibility, from dependence to independence. And I know there's going to be people listening to this that will go, yeah, I've definitely been in jobs that I didn't like. I've definitely followed paths I wasn't sure of. So what what's the one thing? This is a deep question, okay? You ready for this? this what's the one thing? the Sanjay today would go back and tell the Sanjay who was 20 back then. Listen to your gut. Listen to your gut. And it's, it's a cliche, I know, but I, there's been no time in my life where I've ever thought that's this more truer. Mm. Because if I go back and think about a lot of the things that I did, and not that I regret doing those things, mm -hmm. but if I look, if I, if I had that, 
benefit of hindsight. And I remember my gut feeling telling me, this is not right. This is not where you should be going. I should have listened because a lot of times I think I just kind of suppress it. It's like, no, 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 that's, that's silly. You know, I, I need, you know, for example, when I started this career, um, this was working in the recruitment industry in the city, you know, working with investment banking technologists, you know, it was a, it was a great, it's a great career. It's a great job. It's a great paying job, but it wasn't me. Mm. But part of me was just like, well, why would you say no to this much money? Yeah, because isn't that the point? I mean, yeah, you're 18, 19, 20. You just—it's all about making money, right? That's all you think about. Well, that's all I was thinking about, anyway. But yeah. for me, for sure. So, um, so I kind of stuck at it because of that. But something inside me was telling me strongly that this is not what you should be doing, and you yeah. need to go and find, uh, you know, exactly what it is. Um, and yeah, so I would just say to myself, listen, listen to that inner voice. It's a beautiful, beautiful point. I'm going to pick up on a few points there. And, you know, it's so interesting. Something that I'm deeply fascinated by is is the maps of our life and how we're spoken to then relates to how we think. And that's exactly what you were just talking about there, Sanj. Um, how, you know, for you, you were in this this paradigm, the way you were thinking was that, you know, money was everything. Um, and then once you received it, it wasn't necessarily what it was cracked up to be. Why didn't you talk talk us through you know that point where you had been earning, um, you you'd been earning really well yet you didn't quite feel fulfilled? Were there any specific moments or stories? Yeah, there, there, there's definitely a few. I mean, I was because I because I started work at a relatively young age compared to a lot of people. I was always the youngest guy in the in the office or the youngest person in the office. So there was always people who were slightly older than you, you know, in their mid twenties, in their thirties, and you know they would have the car, they would have the motorbike, they would have the flashy suits, and you know you look up to all this, and that's what you're surrounded by every single day, and you're just thinking, okay, well this is the world I'm living in, this is what I need to strive for, um, and of course who doesn't want to, you know, have the flashy thing? What well, again? So who doesn't? Many people don't, but again, as a young child growing up in London, this is what this is what I I saw as the bright lights of big city. So I remember going, you know when I would go to work, it would be like, right, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to aim to buy this car. Right. I was in, really into cars at the time. So I was going to, I'm going to buy this car. So I would, you know, work hard and I'd save the money and I'd get the car. Then a friend of mine who I worked with, he's like, oh, he's got into motorbikes and he took me out on his motorbike. And I was like, he's like, oh, I'll get a license. He's really, I've got, I've got a motorbike license <laughs> and I got the motorbike. I was like, yeah, I can do this. And wow. you know, so, so I started accumulating at, Things, material things. Yeah. So it's accumulating the cars, the motorbike. I eventually got bought a flat in London, you know, and I was just like, wow, this is this is amazing. So there was I remember there was a point where I was sitting in my flat, my brand new flat that I had in London. I'd furnished it, you know, and you know, I'm into like furnishes and design. So I made it look, you know, really cool and had my car outside, had my boat motorbike outside. And had my big screen TV and my 17 speakers around me and all wow, yeah, that. The wow. whole, it was, yeah, not that many, but um, and I was miserable. Yeah. And I remember sitting there thinking, hold on a minute. I've got everything that I thought I wanted. Yes. But why do I still have that feeling inside my stomach telling me that something's not right and you're not, you're not happy. And that for me was a, big big moment and it it was it was almost like that voice inside of me just became louder it's like hey i've been telling you this whole time yeah almost you know and i think that was a big big turning point that's such a relatable story and a beautiful story as well and one that i know many people will resonate and maybe for some people that moment isn't about accumulating wealth maybe it's something completely different maybe it was a relationship that you're in and you realize that this isn't what you actually wanted something that quite often the coaches ask me is i want to know what i really want mm. and you know i think the thing that's not really said but i think the thing that nearly everybody wants is to get to know themselves on a deeper level and all of the things that we encounter in our lives is like a, a springboard for us to get to know ourselves better and essentially that's what you were describing and um, so this this kind of higher self voice was like, Sanjay, what are you doing? You know, follow your heart, do something different. What was the next chapter of your life after that? Because you'd seemingly achieved so much at a very young age in a very competitive world as well. What was the next chapter? That chapter 
went on for a while of of not listening to that voice. Yeah. Because it's hard, right? right. You've yes. accumulated a certain amount of wealth and a certain standard of living mm. off that wealth. It's then hard to just turn that off and just go and, you know, pack a backpack and go and follow your dreams. And so I, I didn't do anything. I just carried on. Mm. I just kept doing what I was doing. And that was, again, the point which I, where I wish I'd come back and said, listen to your gut, because that just let me down. I don't know what you want to call it, anxiety, depression, you know, whatever the words are, low mood. I, I just went through this phase of just going through the motions. Mm. And, you know, I would, I would, you know, lots of sick days because I didn't want to go into work. Mm. I remember, I've never actually said this to anyone. Mm. Um, and there's only you here, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I used to go to work and because I was in a senior position, I would, I would make up meetings. I would make up, pretend, make up meetings. And I would get on the tube. I don't know if you know the London tube system. There's a circle line. I'd sit on the circle line and I'd get on at one stop and I'd go all the way around the circle line until I got back to that stop and I'd get off and go back to work. Wow. And this became a habit. If any of my previous employers are listening, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the camera. I'm very sorry. I didn't know what I was doing. Yes. <laughs> but... You know, that sort of behavior. And and, I, and even then I'm doing that. I'm sitting there going, oh, no, this is not right. This is not right. So I didn't, the truth is I didn't do anything. I didn't act upon it. And then um, it was a a holiday that I went to um, to Dubai. I went to Dubai for, for a holiday. Uh, I've got some family who who moved out there. Uh, so I thought, oh yeah, no, I need a holiday. I haven't been on holiday for a while. So I went to Dubai and um, I loved it. I thought this is this is fantastic, you know. It's the sun, the sea, the sand. It's you know, it's great. And you know, when you know, when you go on holiday, you know, if you go on holiday with your friends or you go with your family, you stay in a hotel or you stay in a resort, you see that country, but you see it through the lens of a tourist. Mm -hmm. You see it through the lens of someone who's coming to stay at these fancy resorts, and you know, he's just going to be there for a short period of time. But when I went there, when and I stayed with my family, I saw their life. Mm the same life that a similar life that we lead here in the UK, but I saw them doing it out there. The kids were going to school, you know, the dad would go to work and, you know, so I'd saw, I saw that side mm -hmm. of it and I thought, this is really, this is quite cushy. This is quite nice. Um, and, um, just literally whilst I was on holiday, I applied to some jobs. I thought, let me, let me see if I could work out here i could wow. i could i could get a job out here doing what i was already doing right so i was still in the same industry still working in recruitment so let me see if i could if i can get a job and this was dubai in 2006 2007 so it was kind of like um it was still crazy time uh, it was kind of like you know money was being thrown everywhere and i got like you know four or five interviews straight away straight away and i was like ah oh. Then I thought, and that was a moment where I realized, oh, wow, I'm actually worth something. Mm. You know, there's, there's value to all these years that I've been doing this job, even though I've not really enjoyed it, there's clearly a value there. Yeah. And if I can get someone in Dubai and the money was that was an offer was, was just ludicrous yeah. compared to what I was earning. So um, the next step was obvious to me. It was, I need to get out of London and move to Dubai. Okay. And just, and then what happened? We need to know more. So you got out to London. Did you take that job in recruitment? Now, I know some people in the pod will know that Sanjay had uh, another role in Dubai, which probably came a bit later, but I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm on tenterhooks. What happened next? Um, I've missed out a big, big chunk here. Okay. Yeah. And I, I should just go back a little bit. So during this time where I was kind of, um, you know, had all the the fancy things was you know living the dream as, as some people think it was um i got married wow. uh, for the first time so not to anisha yeah. uh, and it was a it was look it was a it was an office romance you know i was the the, the, the senior guy as a young girl and we, we we hit it off and i was in love i'm not gonna lie i was i was in love and i genuinely got married i you know, felt that this was it this was going to be it so I got married and the whole Dubai thing was kind of us going to go out there and she was also up for it. And, you know, she was like very keen. Yeah, let's go. So we did that. So we went out to Dubai. So I carried on doing the job that I was doing. She found an amazing job as well. So we had two incomes in Dubai, which is phenomenal. That's a lot of money. And again, you know, we went out there, bought the nice cars, you know, had the nice flat and all of these things. 
and the same voice was there. Mm, 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 mm. So part of me was like, at the time when I was in London, I was like, oh, it's London. You know, it's waking up in the winter when it's dark. You get to work and it's dark. You get home and it's dark. There's, there's part of that, you know, the SAD uh, feeling. So I thought, well, it must. And when I went to Dubai, I didn't have that feeling. I was like, oh, it's sunny here. It's yeah. nice. It's warm. And you know, I, you know me. I hate the cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, this is this is this is where I need to be. And um, no, nothing really. I say nothing changed. A lot of things did change, but it felt like the emotional side of it. Nothing had changed. Yeah. I was still feeling that dread, that still feeling that, why are you doing this? This is not something that you enjoy. Um, so while I was out there, um, during, so during this whole time in my life, the, those, those 10 years, um, I was um, into health and fitness. I was, in, I was you know, a member of the gym. I went to the gym. I worked out. Not, not very seriously. Like most people just, you know, three times a week, go to the gym, keep yourself fit, you know, just to justify all the drinking and all the smoking and all the things <laughs> that you do with the drinking <laughs> champagne. And I know that. about that. <laughs> right, exactly. So I was like, well, I'm doing all of that stuff. So I need to work out and just yeah. balance it out. You know, yeah, yeah. we know it doesn't work that way, but yeah, yeah. so that's what I did. <laughs> um, so when I went out there, I found a gym and I started doing some, you know, going to the gym, started doing some classes. And then there was this one guy, this one trainer, again, it just something about him mm. when I went to his classes and when I um, spoke to him and just this energy and this vibe here about him. I was like, wow, this is what he was doing when he was up on the stage and the way he made me feel. Yeah. I think that's the key thing. The yeah. way he made me feel, I was like, wow, that's so cool. I want to do that. Yeah. And part of him was like, I can do that. I know I can do that. And that voice inside of me just got louder. It's like, do it. Yes. Yeah. This is this is this is the right this is the right way, right? This is the right direction, right? It's like a compass. It's like yeah, go this way. It's not the compass is not telling you this is your exact destination. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Company. It's not Google Maps. Yeah. It's just pointing you in the right direction. So I was like, right, this is the thing to do. So um, I. It's funny that before that at this same gym, I saw an advert, saw just a, like a little leaflet for become a personal trainer. And I thought, oh, and that's kind of stoked the interest. I looked into that. I spoke to the guy at the gym. And I was like, look, you know, the guy who's running the program, he was a bit younger than me. And I was like, look, you know, I'm approaching 30. Should I be a, I don't know, a PT at 30? And he, he was, you know, unlike the physiotherapist, this guy was just like, no, mate, it's the best thing you can do. And he was like really encouraging and really supportive. And, you know, you've got a job, doesn't matter. We can help you. You can do part-time. You can come on the weekends. Like, he was really, really, really helpful. So I was like, well, I'm just going to do this. So I started studying um, to be a BT part-time. And then it got to a point where I qualified and this, this gym that I used to work, they said, look, you can come and teach some classes here. You've qualified, you went through us and you know, I was like, okay, great. Yeah. So again, part-time I'd go in the evenings, teach some classes on the weekends. And that was it. I was just like, this is the, the, the feeling I got from this few hours I would do in the evenings or the weekends. It, it just far surpassed any satisfaction I had in the last 10, 15 years wow. of working in that career. I mean, the money, none of that put all of that aside. This, this, it was, I remember, actually, I remember it clearly. It was this one lady mm. and she used to come to my classes and she's just go in the back and she never said a word to me. She would just do her own thing and she'd just be going along. And one day, months later, she came up to me at the end of the class. I was like, oh, she's actually going to talk to me. Mm. And she goes, I just want to say that I really enjoy your classes and I've been listening to everything that you've been saying up on the stage. Cause you know, you give little tips, make sure you drink your water, make sure you eat this. And she goes, I've been listening to everything you're saying and you've really transformed my life. Wow. And I just thought, I haven't done anything, but thank you. Cause yeah. I really love doing what I do. And yeah. I'm, I'm just happy that for me, just that, that one person just saying that it was just worth it. And I think that was the moment that I knew that I was meant to do something like that where I'm helping people to improve their lives. Um, and, and that was it. I quit my job. And what a story. What a story. Full time. Oh, I've got a, such a, a great kind of feeling and energy from, from that beautiful story, from being sitting in that flat in London with the speakers and the cars and the motorbike to fast forward, then being on stage in Dubai training and a lady comes up and says that. And I think once you, once you taste that helper's high, it's, 
it brings so much meaning. You know, I have this, I have this thing called the fulfillment formula. I shared it with you ages ago, right? It's like fulfillment comes from, um, first of all, feelings, positive experiences, then skills that you develop that require your full focus. But fulfillment won't mean anything until you contribute, you use your, your family, times by your family, giving those skills to your family. And that's what you found in that moment that you were just, you'd finally experienced the end user. And, you know, in your recruitment job, I'm sure people were benefiting, but it's not quite the same in terms of the transformation of lives on a one-to-one basis, especially when you got to kind of a senior level, I imagine. Yeah. So I would help people find jobs. Yeah. So there is obviously, that's a big, it's a big thing for people to find, you know, someone helps them to find a job, but you're right. When you got to the senior level, you know, when you're dealing with salaries in six figures, and you've just helped someone go from one hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year to one hundred and thirty thousand pounds a year. Yeah, I mean that's there's not that ten thousand pounds is not going to make a huge difference to their life. And yes, they've got a new job, but it was there wasn't the same that same sense of gratification. And I think more than that, although there was gratitude, you know, people were grateful. I think more than that, it was the the processes that we would we would engage in. Yeah to do the job. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to be politically correct here, but you know, it was a lot of, it's a lot of schmoozing. It's yeah. a lot of information gathering. It's a lot of finding out, you know, there was no LinkedIn, right? Yeah. So if I, if you yeah. wanted to know, if I wanted to know who this person was, who, if someone said, I, I need the person who can do this, I'd have to find out who that person was at the, at all the different banks. And then I have to go in there and try and poach them. Now to get that information, you have to do lots of different things. I'm not going to talk about those things on on the podcast, but those things didn't sit well with me. And I was being trained to do that. And I was just thinking, this can't be right. This cannot, I cannot be, this cannot be the, the basis of an honest, you know, fulfilling life where you're doing these devious techniques to just to get information out of people. Yes. So it was less the the gratification. Yes, but it was more the actual, the, the, the nature of the job as well. Yeah. And I think actually it's an important point to bring up that one thing we can be grateful for with the internet is that because we are so much more connected now, things are on one side a lot more transparent and it's not as possible to have that. Yes. But let's let's move on. So, so you've wonderfully described how now you've shifted from high level recruitment exec or senior position over to personal trainer. You're living your dreams. You're following what's in your heart. And then what, 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 what transpired after that? Because of course, that's such a massive life decision and that will impact a number of people, right? It wasn't just about you or impact the people around you. What transpired then, Sanj? After I went full-time, so I quit my job in, in recruitment and went full-time into, into training, um, my wife left me. So this was just a big, massive blow. You know, I was on this high... I've moved countries, you know, I've just transformed my life, my career. I'm doing something that I literally was buzzing out of bed in the morning to go and do. And then I was this bombshell. So <clears throat> that really set me back. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it. Um, so yeah, again, I kind of went into a bit of a downer. Um, I was, you know, we're trying to fig- fig- figure things out. And then it just, you know, it, it didn't materialize. Um, so that moment, I I remember clearly thinking, well, what's in my control right now? Mm. What can I influence? What can I make happen? I thought about it and I thought, well, I'm relatively new in this career as a personal trainer in fitness. Um, so my in my within my control now is to make myself the best fitness professional that I can potentially be. So that's what I'm going to do. Mm. So literally every waking moment that I had went into figuring out how can I become the best trainer I can. And that started from me, my physical state, you know, it's about, right, I need to transform me first and just make mm-hmm. me, you know, and it, look, it's, and it wasn't because I was, it wasn't a aesthetic thing. It wasn't like, you know, look at me. It was just like, look, I, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. 
you know, having been coming into this game late, not having been the natural sportsman when I was a younger child, you know, I was, I had weight issues and all these things. So I wasn't a naturally gifted sports person. So I thought, well, the only way I'm going to really differentiate myself is to have the, the knowledge have the understanding and you've got to look a certain way as well. Mm -hmm. And, and this is Dubai at the end of the day, right? It's, yeah, it's all about yeah, yeah. looks. So I put everything into myself, my body. I started reading books. I remember I read Tim Ferriss's four hour body. That was one of the first books. And I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is amazing. I started reading a lot more of, you know, other books that I started reading at the time. Um, uh, I've forgotten that Neil Strauss. He had a few books. There's a, there's, a, there's a number of authors. I remember I started just I just started reading, and getting into podcasts because podcasts were kind of coming into their into their own. There, so listen to podcasts, fitness podcasts, Brent Greenfield, all these people going on all these wow. courses, wow. and um, it just consumed me. And but in you know some people look at that and you know you, you could look at it two ways. And some people might go after a traumatic event like a divorce or someone leaving you, and you know you you know eat more or start drinking or start smoking. And for me, I just went into the gym. Right. Uh, got into the gym. And when I wasn't in the gym, I was studying what will I do when I'm in the gym or yes. I was studying what will I do to these, what can I do for these clients? What can I do here? Um, and that was a really transformative experience because through doing that, and I know you talk about this a lot, I started surrounding myself with like-minded people with people who were on the same vibe, on the same journey, on the same, had the same goals. And I was thinking, oh, oh, wow. And, and again, for, I had friends when I was in recruitment. In fact, I've got some really good friends that I still keep in touch with today from those days in recruitment. Yeah. However, I never felt like this is my tribe. Right. Right. And this, when I was around those people in the fitness industry, I just felt at home and there was something inside me was like, this is, Again, that voice inside of me is like, this is where you need to be, Sanj. This is what you need to be doing. Mm. And that was it. I literally just put myself... I remember I used to work crazy hours. I mean, I'd wake up. My first client would be at 6 a.m. I'd, I'd be the one opening up the gym. You know, my last client might be at 10, 10 p.m. at night. You might have a two or three hour gap in the middle of the day. But I would... Wow. I would, but it didn't... I didn't feel like, you know, burnt out, you know, working, overworking. I just was this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. And I just engrossed myself into, into my work yeah. and into my passion. And it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. What a story. What a story. So interesting to hear this kind of take that when you're doing something that you love, that you're able to be just a huge amount more able to cope with the challenges of the intensity of the, the job. Because it feels like play, right? It doesn't yeah. feel like work. Yeah. And, um, you know, kind of like what we're doing right right now, it feels like we're just playing. We're having two, two guys just having a, a deep conversation and yeah, I, I completely resonate with that. So things significantly improved. You got deep into personal growth, you got deep into wellness and there was a significant transformation. Would you say, what would you say is the point that you really transformed? Because, you know, it's really interesting, right? When you moved to Dubai from London, Although the location changed, the habits didn't change. Am I right? Yes. But it's here, it sounds like this was the real moment that the habits really shifted. Would you say this was the kind of first point where you had a new identity and you were with the, a new tribe? Yeah, I, 100%. And like I said, I had that imposter syndrome. So I was like, well, how do I, how do I get rid of that, that feeling? How do, I, what, what do I, how do I do become this, this person I want to become? And... All I did was, again, this is what, you know, I know you talk about this, is I just looked at other people who were doing the thing that I wanted to do. And I said, right, what are they doing? Yeah. What courses have they been on? Yeah. What podcasts are they listening to? What books have they read? Where do they train? What exercises do they do? And, you know, I literally, that's what I did. And I, you know, I, I remember in the gym, actually, used to, used to, you get paid only for doing when you're actually training. And the receptionist get paid to be there. And there was this one receptionist, I remember her name, Kelly. She was amazing. Hi, Kelly, if you're listening. Um, yeah. And she was like, why are, you, why are you here? I was like, because I'm just hanging out. She's like, but you're not getting paid to be here. You're only getting paid to, to train. I was like, yeah, I know, but I'm, you know, and do remember this is my first job ever in a gym. I was like, this is cool. I, why would I not want to hang out in a gym? <laughs> this is, this is great. And, and, and also I was like, well, also I want to be here because if someone walks in and, they want to talk to a personal trainer. You've got no personal trainers here. So I'm just hanging about. And if someone wants to chat, just tell them to come and talk to me. And just by doing that, 
I used to pick up so many clients yeah. because all the other PTs have gone home because they're that's my break or I'm not I'm not I'm not supposed to be at work and yeah. I'll just be hanging about talking to people and you know trying out some some moves in the gym trying to handstands or whatever it was yeah, at the time yeah, yeah. right <laughs> and um, so so yeah sorry I've forgotten the question. yes so this was this was a, a big time where those those habits changed this is when your identity shift identity shift yes yeah, so I started to identify as this 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 trainer and this is why I was saying I started to look at the habits and the 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 um, behaviors of other people and just start copying them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, success leaves clues. There's a famous quote said by loads of different people, Tony Robbins quite famously. And, you know, for anyone who really wants to transform and shift their identity, you can kind of take a course and you can do the occasional behavior. You can even try and start to talk a little differently. But things only shift when you repeatedly do different things when it becomes subconscious it becomes a habit and and that's what you demonstrated then it's this is not easy you know for anyone here i'm sure people have tried to change the habits have tried to shift their beliefs these are the two big things that we're talking about and but it's a painful process right i just want to bring back something that we spoke about quite a while ago but i know i know that i resonate with this i know there's going to be people who listen that will resonate with this and this is the topic of people pleasing so you said back then you were a little bit more of a people pleaser. Just talk me through how that manifested in the different areas. So maybe in your relationships, but maybe also at work. Like how did that manifest in your life? How did you realize, oh, I'm a bit of a people pleaser? How did I realize I was a people pleaser? Interesting. I think I've only realized recently when I've looked back. Yeah. I think I've only realized when I've, when I've questioned, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. And the only logical answer I could come up with was actually, no, I remember I was trying to maybe impress people. Right. Yeah. And you know, when my work, so for example, and actually, do you know where I think this stems from? I just, just, I think I've just, I was talking, I've spoken to Anisha about this a lot. I think it stems from the fact that I didn't get a degree. Yeah. Because I felt, I, I still feel to, to, to some degree, even though I don't believe it, um, that society, you know, there's an expectation if you have a degree, you're going to get put on this pedestal. If you don't have a degree, it's like you're there. And I always felt that, I always felt that not getting a degree at the time, not going to university was the right thing to do because that's what my inner voice was telling me. But then I also felt that now I have something to prove because I don't have this piece of paper that says I'm qualified to do X, Y, and Z or I've gone through X, Y, and Z. So even from the moment I started my full-time job at 18 mm, mm, mm. and I'd been doing that job already for two, two, nearly two years, probably more than that. Yeah. Six, I started when I was 16. So 16 to 18 part-time in the evenings on the week on Saturdays when we used to go in, even though I'd been doing it for two years, I still felt like I've, I'm full-time now. I've got to prove myself. Right. I'm, I'm the new kid. I'm the young guy. People are thinking, what's this? Why is this teenager coming to work here? So I literally had to just please it. I had to people please. I had to do things that people saw. I was like, wow, this guy actually can do it. He, he is capable. So I think a lot of my drive, and this is where I have the, the trouble with, not trouble, but it's like, in, in a way I'm like, well, what's wrong with people pleasing? Because in, in, in this example, I felt like it drove me to want to perform, even though I was trying to perform at something that ultimately wasn't something that I would see as my purpose. And I even, I, I felt like I, maybe I didn't know it at 18, that probably came a bit later. So at that age, I was just like, well, I need to impress people because I need to show that I'm, I'm capable. But that, that not having a degree, not having, you know, the experience as a PT mm -hmm. even, um, you know, I was always, I felt like I was always one step behind everyone else. So I felt like I, that was the only way, but I felt like, cause I, I look back now and I think, well, I, I was people pleasing a lot, but I think that drove me Yeah, because I wanted to get, people to say, well done, Sanj. Yeah, you're, you've done an amazing job. Well done, Sanj. Yeah. And I think maybe some of that comes back to things that happened in childhood. Absolutely. I was about to say that. That's absolutely right. And, you know, I think anyone, and I can say this as an ex-people pleaser for sure, but a lot of people pleasing, seeking validation outside of yourself is when you are questioning your own internal validation, when you are not sure that you're enough, when you don't feel worthy. And I know that anyone who, who's here who 
feels like I don't have a problem with being worthy, I would challenge you. Everyone does. Everyone has this question in their head at some stage or another. Um, but I just gonna I'm gonna challenge you on something that you said. You know, you said that um, ha not having a degree was something that really you didn't feel adequate. You didn't feel like you had got something that that was really needed. And you said society tells us that we need to have that. I'm just gonna challenge you for a minute on this, because what if you came from a family of entrepreneurs where none of them had a degree, and maybe that family was extremely successful and that family had multiple businesses? How would they feel about you not going and get a degree? Hmm. I feel, <laughs> I feel like they would still want you to get a degree. Yeah. I, I feel at that time. I, I think I'm seeing this with my Asian Gujarati boy. And class. this is what I'm, this is, this is my point. This right. is my exact point is that, you know, and I'll share something. You know, I, I, I was very lucky when I was uh, 1997, I went and moved to the Netherlands. And in this, in the Netherlands, my mum and dad sent me to a British school where there were 64 nationalities in this school. And it's literally the most diverse school you can, you can imagine. And, you know, we meet people from, I know we're pretty diverse here in the UK, but that was, they were Dutch people. We'd learn Dutch, we'd learn French, we'd learn Spanish, all this stuff. And at that moment, a lot of the kind of Asian beliefs that I had living in the UK kind of got smashed down pretty quickly because we were hanging out with so many different people. Mm. And it was like a, a, a novelty to hang out with people who are from the same background as us. So my point is, is that sometimes the kind of the, the world that we see, the beliefs that we have are, are not as fixed as as we originally think they are. And, you know, Steve Job famously says, you know, when you learn to to poke life and you see what comes out on the other end, then you can become the author, you can become the creator. So I think that's what you were discovering, right? Mm. At that stage, you were starting to discover maybe what I'd been told isn't actually the real way that things are meant to be. Maybe it's not, maybe that's not the script. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and I think it, it was, and yeah, you know, having said that, I mean, my, none, my parents didn't go to university, right? Um, my grandparents didn't go to university. Uh, I think my dad's, one of my dad's brothers went to university. His mm. sister didn't go to university. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, my sister, and my, my brother and sister went, they were younger than me. Um, but I, f it was, it was, you know, the importance is put on that. Not just, definitely from family, from parents. You know? yeah. And, and yeah, again, look, I'm not sitting here, I'm not blaming anyone sure, for sure. No, actions, behaviors. You know, I truly believe that people act and they did the best that they can with what they have available at the time. And, Absolutely. And I, I totally see that. Um, but the, I did feel that there was that, that pressure there, not just from family, but from externally as well um, within the school system, um, within, you know, trying to get jobs and all, all of these things. So, um, but you're right. I think, you know, you go on that discovery. And it was actually when I started working in the city, I met this this guy, Alex, who was one of the, he was the most successful um, sales guy in in this company I was working at. He was wow. making the most money and he didn't, he didn't go to university. So we really, we, I really connected with him and we really became, he was the one that got me into motorbikes. Ah, amazing. <laughs> so, amazing. So he really kind of, and he was only like, I think I was 18 and he was 22. So we were, we were quite close in, in age, um, compared to everyone else. So he became, he became my best buddy at the time and we hang out. And I think through him, I saw actually, you know what, I don't need to go to university. So it kind of almost validate my decision, but yeah. So it is, it is a, it is a battle that I've had mentally inside of my head, even as I've, you know, later in life where yeah. I've, I've actually, you know, and, and I've, I've actually gone back and got, no, I'm going to go and do the degree again. And I've started another degree and I didn't finish it. Yeah. And, you know, again, it was like, I, I did it. I was like, oh, I really want to do this. And then I just really question, do you really want to do this? Yes. Or are you just doing it so that people will go, well done, Sanjay, you've got a degree. And yes. ultimately that was the answer. I, I, yeah. I realized it after spending thousands of pounds again on a, as an adult on, on, on a, on a degree and doing the first year or whatever it was, I think I did, yeah, first year of a, of a, of a, of a course. And I was like, I'm, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this just so. I feel like that I'm accepted by the world or by whoever yeah. it was. And, and that, that was, that was the moment where I realized I'm this, I know I'm, I'm done this. I don't need, I don't need this piece of paper. I don't need this validation. Uh, and again, I just looked back and reflected upon 
everything that I've done in my life and all the achievements that I made without going to university. I said, well, I know people that have gone to university that haven't done half of those things. So I'm okay. I love that. I love that. And it's, you know, the only thing you need to smash down a belief is just one good piece of evidence to the contrary. That's right. And all of a sudden, you know, the whole way that you see the world, all of a sudden it just just fizzles and becomes something completely different. And I, I love what you said there. I love what you said in that you even, again, so many people are going to resonate with this, that most of us walk through life, and I like to call it like a reactive pinball, you know, like I was this reactive pinball, looking outside of ourselves for things, thinking that those are the things that are going to fulfill us. Like, oh, I'll, I'll get that degree or oh, that that relationship or that car or that Dubai, that trip there. And it after a while, we realize that it's not the things outside of us, but it's the things inside of us that we can see in ourselves. Um, and that that's how you find clarity. And once you find that, then you can still have all those things externally, but without that attachment and grasping and clinging onto those things. Um, so it's so it's so incredibly true. But there's there's another fascinating chapter, another few fascinating chapters to this story. So you went deep into personal growth. You're on the Ben Greenfield. You're on the wellness. You're reading all everything to be the best trainer you can. You've had phenomenal success with your own personal transformation and with your clients now. You're riding high in Dubai. And, but there's, there's something missing, right? There's something there still that was missing, even though you were nailing it on that front. Perhaps on this relationship front, you were still feeling that there was a little bit of disconnection there. Until, of course, there's another chapter. Until I'm Anisha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So not long after, not long after my divorce was even finalized, um, I remember coming back to the UK for the summer. So in Dubai, July, August is, you know, it's 50 degrees and people just leave, you know, especially expats. You know, people school, School's on holiday, summer holiday. So a lot of people just exit the country. And so I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do the same. It's going to be quiet. Clients will go away. There's not much work. So I came to the UK uh, for a couple of months and I did organize this trip to Spain and with friends and stuff. And then um, one of my friends who um, I'm just in touch with, in fact, he moved out to Dubai eventually as well. He was, it was his wife's his wife, his wife at the time, her birthday. And um, that's when I met Anisha. So I met Anisha. It was a holiday romance. You know, I was here for the summer, a bit like Greece. <laughs> uh, there's probably people thinking, what's he talking about? Um, <laughs> no, we know Greece. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so then I met her and we had a great time together and it got to the point where I was going back to Dubai and she's like, what now? I was like, well, I don't know what now <laughs> I'm going back to Dubai. And she's like, well, so, so anyway, cut a long story short, we, we, we did, we had a long distance relationship. I was like, well, you know, and, and again, there was part of me was like, what are you doing? You just got to just, you know, and, and before that moment, now I had a, I had a period in Dubai where I was single and life was just amazing, right? You <laughs> single, I was a PT, I had you know, all these things. And it was like, I was really enjoying my life. And then part of me was like, what are you doing? Why are you? But, you know, your heartstrings get pulled, you get, they get pulled. And Absolutely. So we, we did this, so we just, just did long distance. I thought, well, and part of me was like, this is the best of both worlds, mate. You get to have a girlfriend. She's not living with you. She's not in the same country as you. <laughs> not because I want to do any, get up to anything, any mischief, but, you know, you get, I get that separation, I get that space, I still get to enjoy. And um, so we did long distance and it was amazing. Um, so we did long distance for a couple of years and yeah, and cut long story short, here we are married and second kid on the way. I mean, it's more that I, I completely get this. And actually this then relates to a little bit about extroversion and introversion. And, you know, I went through a lot of the start of my life being a massive extrovert where people just thought, oh, Nilesh always wants to be around people, etc. But as, as I started to grow and mature especially when i went on my own personal journey and personal growth i started to become more of an introvert and so i know what you mean then it's more about just having space as opposed to especially when you've been through so much and you were still kind of get to know yourself a little better than to welcome someone else into that intimate space when you weren't quite you know completely comfortable with that and i i, I completely get what you're saying there um but we love Anisha. I know Anisha so well. And she's uh, absolutely, she's not paying me to say this, by the way, but she's absolutely incredible. She's got some great stories too. Yeah. Um, such a vivacious personality. And and you guys have 
what's such a beautiful relationship from what I can see. And it always fills me with a lot of joy. Like I said, at the start of the podcast, it's got a great energy in this house. So, okay, so you met Anisha and you're doing the whole long distance thing. You've kind of semi found yourself. Things are going well in Dubai. And then, of course, there's another there's another twist, another kind of big, big decision that you had to make, right? Yeah, so it was the, it got to a point where the long distance relationship was getting to a point where we're like, well, what, where is this? Where is this going to go? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's all fun, and we'd meet, you know, random locations in the world, and meet in Spain, and meet here, and mm-hmm. and would have these holidays and stuff, and, and that was great fun. But so, like, what, what's going to happen? So, and you know, Anisha was um, at the time she was a pre reg pharmacist, so she was mm-hmm. doing her pre reg um, in hospital, and uh, once she finished that, she's like, well, I want to move out to Dubai. And I had never, ever, ever hinted to her or asked her or suggested to her. And, and, and I know why I didn't do that because of what happened with the previous marriage. And I think with the previous marriage, it was all me. I want to move to Dubai. Let's move to Dubai. And I was a salesman. So I sold it. Yeah, that's what I did. And so I convinced this person to go to Dubai and it didn't work out. So that was, you know, it was a lesson learned. I was like, right, I'm never going to force anyone to, I didn't force her. You know, I didn't, I'm not going to try and put my opinion sure. strongly forward like that. And yeah. I'll just, I won't say anything, but she came up with it and she said, look, I want to move to Dubai. And I, and for, it wasn't to me, it was like, Hey, if that, are you sure that's what, and I didn't, that's not the, my first reaction. My first reaction, do it, let's do it. But, mm-hmm. and then we had, we, we spoke about it. I was like, are you sure this is what you want to do? You're leaving by your, your, your career. She goes, well, I've just started my career. You know, I was like, okay, well, you know, you'll get a job here, but you know, we, are you sure? But so she made the decision that no, we want, I want to be together. And the only, yeah. and she's, she said, you're not going to move back to London. Are you? I was like, at that time I was like, no way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and so she's like, well, then if the only way we could be together is to, for me to be in Dubai, then, then, then that's what I'll do. So that's what she did. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's very, very special to have a partner that would, that would do that for you. That would kind of up sticks and she didn't have family out there, did she? Or maybe no, she did. No, no, she didn't know anyone apart no, from you. She only knew me. And, um, that's, that's very, very special indeed. So Nisha moved over you guys had, um, how long were you there actually together before things obviously moved? So I was there in total for 10 years. So when, and Anisha was there in total for five years. So she was there for the last five years. So half the time that I was there amazing okay so you five years of you guys again just talk me through the career then so you still full on the pt vibes had you developed any kind of other interests or wings or anything what, what do you think working as a pt out there what do you think you really um what was the most enjoyable part of that for you you spoke a little bit about the transformation of, of people have you got any more stories or any more kind of yeah, any bits of wisdom that you found from that from that time working as a PT there? Never ask a PT if they have stories. They've got lots of <laughs> stories. They're just not going to tell them. <laughs> no. I, um, so, yeah, I was still on the PT vibe. I was still on the fitness vibe. I was very much um, doing it. I was freelancing at a, a few other, um, a, a few gyms around Dubai because I couldn't have the structure there works. And um, I was... I was really starting to get into, yeah, it still was to do with people's transformations, but it wasn't to do with physical transformations. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about getting a six pack or getting, you know, guns or, you know, looking a certain way or beach body or anything like that. It was people who were, you know, some people that were, you know, obese clinically you know morbidly obese as well and a couple of a couple of clients who were really really you know struggling i had uh, a lot of people who had injuries so one of the gyms i worked at they had a uh, physiotherapy injury rehabilitation uh, arm wing to it and they would see people and then they would send them to us as trainers and we would help them through rehabilitation mm-hmm. um it would be people who you know a lot of i used to train a lot of housewives because you know a lot of a lot of Families move out there because the, the husband gets a job as a pilot or a banker or whatever it was, and the, the wives would be at home and they would come to the gym and have a PT. So, um, you know, it became a, a and any trainer would know this. You become like this emotional support to these yeah. people, yeah. This, yeah. this 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 network because they see you, they don't see anyone else, and it was seeing that people change through through exercise, through the things that I'm telling them to do, through nutrition, I mean, through this whole journey, n- nutrition 
nutrition has always, always been something I was into from, from a very young age because I had problems with eating mm -hmm. and overweight issues when I was younger. So mm. I, I, I fixed that through nutrition. So nutrition was always things. So I always, I was doing loads of courses and trying to get a better understanding of nutrition, but it was, yeah, helping people through just these simple tr changes in their lives where not it wasn't the physical benefits. It was just the mental benefits. I feel better. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've don't have, I'm sleeping better and I'm not, I haven't got brain fog anymore. Or, you know, thanks for telling me about, you know, water or whatever, you know, whatever it was. And it just starts, like, Oh, okay. Well I was getting, again, that, that, a lot that, I don't know what you would call it. The, the kind of the, the inner voice was kind of every time it, it, these, you get these little uh, comments, it was like, it would, it would get louder and louder. And it's like, okay, well this, this seems to be, um, some, there's something here. I didn't know what it was. Yeah, yeah. It was like, they, but again, that compass started to kind of recalibrate. It's like, right, this, this is something that you can do. And I remember I used to spend, um, like an hour and a half talking to, to a client before they even became a client to decide if I wanted to work with them. It wasn't even like, yeah, come and work with me. I, I want a client to be like, I'd spend an hour and a half. And I, I remember at the time, no other trainer did that. And I wasn't getting paid for that time. Mm. I'd do it for free. I'd just sit down with them and I'll just, I just want to find out about them. I would just, and I didn't, and look, I didn't have a structure with this. I didn't, you know, there wasn't a process. I just thought, I just need to know about people. I need to know about their lifestyle. I need to know about their sleep. I need to know about, you know, their stresses, what they do, you know, with what the kids, what time they go to bed or what they, how much they're drinking, all of these things, just so I could get a better understanding of who this person is. And then I can try to help them. Mm. Um, and there was no, I mean, I, there might've been lifestyle medicine at the time. I didn't, I didn't know about it. I didn't call it that, but that's kind of the way I saw things. And the simple reason being is because I know through my own transformation, how getting healthy, losing weight, how that made me feel yeah. mentally as well. I know through family members, through parents who unfortunately, you know, dad's got diabetes and heart disease and all these things. I know how not doing these things can, can uh, impact someone. So for me, it was just to help people who wanted help and just to, to get them to steer clear of these things and just improve the quality of their lives. And that had nothing to do with the way they looked. Wow. Wow. So that's actually a big shift from when you went in this kind of beach body personal transformation journey again, at the end of kind of a deeper exploration within yourself. And once you do that, you radiate a different energy that then encourages other people to do the same. Yeah. And that's, that's so powerful. And it's so true. And it, you know, something I speak about is the the transformative benefit of a conversation and how when you consistently have deep conversations, but with a future focus, with movement forward, it's very important, then, you know, I've seen people come off ADD meds, of chronic pain meds, of anxiety and depression meds. You know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that everyone can do that. I'm be absolutely clear about that. But I know through my coaching practice, I've seen people heal from things which you know, I didn't see when I was working as a, a medical doctor. So I think that's what you're touching on, aren't you? Is that deeper connection that you're having with people. And it was having this quite profound effect on not just them, but other people in their lives. Oh, that's fantastic. So five years out in Dubai, you and Anisha are enjoying it. She's working in pharmacy. You, you're doing the, the PT thing, transforming people mentally and physically. And then what's next? So in this time, so it's five years in Dubai, but we actually were shifting between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, when Anisha came, I think it took her a year. She, 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 I should know this, but she, I remember it was nearly a year she couldn't find work. Really? Yeah. And, she, you know, Anisha, she's very driven, very career oriented. And this was really tougher. And then also in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, shit, she's not finding work. What's going on? Is she going to find some job? Anyway, eventually she found a job in Abu Dhabi. Wow. So it wasn't like she was desperate. It was a good job, but we felt it was a good job. She's like, um, this is, this is a good job. I'm going to, you know, I said, look, Abu Dhabi's an hour and a bit down the road. Um, hours drive away. Um, it is commutable, but I don't really, uh, the driving out there is pretty bad. Mm. Yeah. It's, anyone will know going to Dubai, it's pretty dangerous mm. driving. I mean, you can drive, I say that, but it's, oh, you know, she was new to the country. I, was, I felt uncomfortable. Um, so I just said, look, let's move to, let's move to Abu Dhabi. I was, you moved all the way here. The least I can do is move to, move to Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Um, so we moved to Abu Dhabi 
and then um, that job didn't work out for us. So whilst we were in Abu Dhabi, by the way, I was commuting back to Dubai. So I was doing 120 miles each way every day. Um, and I was still, wow. and I was still getting to my first client at 6am in Dubai. So nice. I would be waking up at f- four, leaving at 4.30, getting to the gym for six, um, five days a week. Wow. Um, while she was working in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi and then that job didn't work out. And then we moved back to Dubai and then she, then we moved, <laughs> this is, couldn't make this up. Yeah. We moved back to Dubai um, we got a place on the Palm and my brother was moving to Dubai from Bahrain. And I said, look, do you want to get a place together, the three of us? Cause it will bring the cost down and we can get a nicer place. And we got a place on the Palm and it was amazing. And then we did that. And then, uh, Anisha got a job in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> Another job in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not moving. I'm not, I'm oh not. I was God. like, you could do the drive this time. So she's like, no, I'll do the drive. So anyway, she, she, she did the drive. So she did the drive for a while. And then, um, it, it, after a year or something it just again the, the toll of that drive and, and yeah. the the work as well for Anisha it wasn't it wasn't gratifying it wasn't satisfying and again she I started it's, this is this is the weirdest thing about this whole story I started seeing or I started getting the same feeling how I felt when I was on that circle line going around and yeah, yeah, yeah. not knowing where I was going, I started to see those behaviors and those that yeah. impression in her. And I was saying, she's not really happy with doing this. But anyway, we carried us. So I said, look, let's just move back to Abu Dhabi. Mm. So we ended up moving back to Abu Dhabi. I did the commute again. And, um, yeah, we were in, so we were, so before we moved back here, we were in Abu Dhabi. So we were in Abu Dhabi for, for a couple of years. And then, um, that's when we got pregnant. Wow. Wow. So you're pregnant. Lily is now five. She's with us. She's four. Oh, yeah, four. Oh, she'll be five she's very gonna be soon, five. right? Yeah, she's the same as Freddie. She's yeah, she's first gonna, year of uh, yeah. of school. And that's funny. So you guys are kind of pinballing back. You're going Abu Dhabi, Dubai. Anisha was getting some work. Um, and you managed to finally get some amazing flat in the farm. And then the nature of it is that you have that pull back. But it sounded like in spite of all of those moods and things, you guys were quite supportive of one another. Like you do this, this time I'll do this, this time, both of you were kind of sharing, uh, that, that view and the mission. And what was really interesting is that you were seeing the same things that you saw when your work wasn't meaningful mm. in Anisha. So what kind of things were they? What, if you could kind of summarize them, what would you say are the signs for you that you're not doing work that's meaningful? I mean, there was she, Anisha's not, Anisha's amazing in the sense that she was amazing full stop, but she's amazing in the sense that if she's had a shit day, she can come through the door and park it at the door and walk in like nothing's happened. Really? Wow. It's amazing. It's an amazing skill. And I don't know how, uh, I don't know how she does it. Yeah. And she's, she's, she's got this thing about her where she can just literally just flick a switch and she can just be present with, with you no matter what's happened. Um, so it was kind of hard to, 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 to discover this, but it was through conversations with her about the work you know? mm-hmm. and it was through conversations that I heard her talk about that she was having with her friends who she did her residency with back in Oxford in the UK. Yeah. And she'd be talking to some of them and, and this was, this was, you remember, this is like a three or four years after she'd said, so this is towards the end, tail end of our time in, in, in the UAE. And she'd be talking to these friends and they'd be doing these amazing things, working in these, you know, these cardiac wards and working in these specialist neuroscience wards and all these things. And she's still, you know, a dispensing, you know, Panadol or whatever yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the medicine medication was at the time. Um, so when I was just hearing her talk about these things, I was like, she's, she sounds like she's not, she's really not fulfilled in her mm-hmm. job. The way she would talk about the work and the people around her work and, you know, you could just get that sense. And then, and then really late on the, the mood did change. Yeah. And then that's, and like I said, cause she's not, she's so hard to read when it comes to that. When I noticed it, it was so obvious. Yeah. I was like, and that's when we, I literally sat down and I was like, listen, what's, what's going on? I mean, do we need to think about going back? And she said, no, I want to, want to stick at it. And again, she will admit this now. It was the money. It was the money that she was earning there compared to what she would be earning here working for the NHS. It was mm-hmm. just ridiculous. It was just a hook. And, you know, look, we, those five years, we had an amazing time. We went traveling around the world. We went to Seoul. We went to 
Kenya, we went to India, we went to Australia. We just used to do, there was... It's freedom. Yeah, it was freedom. It freedom, was, no was, kids, no, no dependents. No kids, no dependent, and loads of money. It was just, it was amazing. Yeah. So that was kind of what kept us in this life of doing, she was, her doing a job that she didn't really do, me traveling two, three hours a day without, you know, just to do what I want to do, which I really wanted to do it. But when we, when we, when we got pregnant, when she got pregnant, I, I, I always say we, and people really tell me off for that. Nah, I like that. <laughs> Sorry. I, like <laughs> um, I think it was a podcast I listened to when Liliana was being born and, and the guy was like, no, it's we. I was like, I saw, I just copied him. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So when, when Lily was born, kind of fast forward, when Lily was born, um, we decided to come back here for the birth because Zanisha had this amazing private medical um, care, which covered maternity birth in, the, in private hospitals in, in wherever you are in the world. Wow. So we came back here, had, had a Liliana here. And also, you know, it was in the other part of it was she was born in August. So like I said earlier, August in the UAE is 50 degrees. And, yeah. and you know what it's like, you know, everybody wants to come out for the birth of, you know, the first grandchild in my course, family, first grandchild in her family. Um, so we were like, look, it's not going to be practical for everyone to come out here in 50 degree heat and staying in hotels and all this stuff. So, so let's just, let's just the two of us go back and we'll make it work. So when we went back there, of course, at the time the baby's born, you know, it's uh, connect, you know, emotions, the family's there, everyone's there. It's, it's a real high, there's a buzz in the air. And, you know, Anish is a very, very family orientated person. Mm -hmm. And I only really realized that when she moved out to Dubai because well, I have never lived with her, right? So when you start living with someone, you start seeing how much they interact with their mom, their dad, their aunts, their cousins. And I'm like, and, I'm, and I wasn't like that in that sense. I was like, wow, I don't do half this stuff. I mean, mm. Again, you start questioning what you're doing. But so being around family um, when we were here, when Lily was born and then Anisha ended up coming back uh, and... Um, this is a whole different story as well, because when Anisha came back, I actually had to quit my job and look after Lily. And Anisha went out to work and I was at home with Lily when she was, you know, weeks old. Um, but yeah, we can get into that. But it was during that time where we both kind of realized that we need family around. Yeah. You know, we do want family around. And Anisha was like, look, I grew up around my family and my grandparents and I really want Liana to have the same kind of relationships that I have with, with my grandparents, yeah. you know, with, with your mum and dad and my mum and dad. And that was a time where I definitely noticed her mood with her work really shift. So for me, it was a, it was, it was a no brainer. And I just, just said, look, I think the right thing to do here is for us to, to move back. Mm. So you're not happy. Um, you know, I'm not working, which was fine. We could, it wasn't like it was a problem me not working, but I felt like I should be, and actually funny enough, that's the time when I wasn't working was when I, when I started stay whole because I, I'll let me just start a blog again. So I just got, bought a domain name and started stay whole and started going on this, this, oh, I'll do YouTube one day. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's when it started. That's when the, the seed was sown. Um, so I said, look, let, and, and, and honestly, I didn't want to come back. Mm, I know you've been open about this a bit. Yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never had kept that a secret. I've, I've, I didn't want to come back, but I felt like it was the right thing to do for my family. It was the right thing to do for Anisha's career um, because she's, you know, she's very driven. It's the right thing to do for my daughter, and just the three of us together, it was the right thing to do. Um, and a really important caveat to that is, you know, I've got. A wonderful opportunity to get to know Anisha on a much deeper level and she is somebody and it's actually quite rare but she is somebody who genuinely loves her work and the way she inspires her students the way she helps in her departments both in all her roles that she has uh, I could listen I mean I know people do people do literally listen to her speak about it for hours because she is a uh, very connected to that role and so it, it sounds like a fantastic decision i'm going to talk about something that's really important because you guys the, the two of you have made like a, a lifetime's worth of big decisions in the space of five years some people just bearing this in mind some couples maybe only live in like one or two places they may be only have, they may be only maybe have one or two jobs certainly in the olden days that that was much more um much more common so my question for you is, how did you guys go about these, these like massive decisions? It sounds like always you, you, you seem to collaborate very well on that. 
But I know that that's not always easy for quite a few people. I, you know, you thought that um, you wanted to stay in Dubai, but Anisha clearly wasn't happy. Like, how, how did you guys work through that process together? Um, so how we made all these big decisions, a lot of it was <clears throat> doing what I didn't do before, mm -hmm. which was I didn't listen to my gut. Mm. So a lot of it was this feels right. And yeah, you 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 logically analyze it and you you think of the you know the pros and cons, but ultimately, for me anyway, it was this feels like the right thing to do. Mm. And Anisha's not so much the kind of gut feel. She's she is she's become she's kind of become more aware of that feeling and that that sensation. Um, so it would be through me saying like this is. This is what I think, and she's telling me what we think. And we'd just discuss it, but ultimately, and then ultimately, it would you know things would come down to what do we really want? Well, we really want to travel. Okay, well, what's gonna what 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 decision can we make now that's going to enable us to do that more? Mm. Well, moving to Abu Dhabi to get this job because we're going to have this much extra money is going to allow us to do mm. these things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here, there was a similar thing. It was like, okay, well, what? Let's let's play this out. Like, what's what's going to happen? Well, we, we, if 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 I I do want to go back to work, I do want to start working. What's going to happen then? Well, we're going to have to get childcare. We're going to have to get a nanny. And in Dubai, in UAE, getting a nanny is you know it's just the, it's just what everyone does. It's just yeah. you get a nanny and that's it. And then part of me also was like, I didn't really want. And look, there's nothing wrong. I'm not putting down anyone who has a nanny, but me personally. I wasn't comfortable with my child being raised by a stranger yeah. who's effectively would be a stranger. Yeah. And, and neither was Anisha. Yeah. So I think that was like, that was like, I don't really want to go down that route. And it was like, what's going to ultimately, what's going to give us the most freedom and the most happiness is going to be being around family, right? Being down the road from your parents or where we don't know where we're going to live at the time, but we, kind of felt was going to be close to our parents, but what's going to give us the ultimate, not, and not just us, I think here, it was like, what's going to give, you know, your Lily's great grandmother, who's, you know, um, unfortunately just recently passed away yeah. at the time. It's like, what's going to give her the most reward? She's going to get to spend some time with her great grand grandchild. Wow. And, you know, my, my, my grandmother, who's Lily's also great grandmother. And she's, so we started thinking of along these lines. And so all well, that, in that sense, it makes sense to, to, to make this decision to go back. So it was, it was a combination of it was a combination of logical thinking, but ultimately it was just down to gut feel. Fantastic! It's such so great to hear you talk through that process because those are big decisions. That it sounds like you initially kind of listened to that gut, but you did map it out, and you know you got to be able to communicate well with someone in order to make those big decisions, and that that that's actually not an easy thing. So I'm shedding a bit of light for you to appreciate that Thank you. you know you can't always control the circumstances of your life right in terms of the things that happen to you but you can control how you respond to them mm. and when you're with someone who understands you when you understand each other that process is so much easier and so much more um you know just runs smoothly so wow this has been amazing i, I there's so much more to ask and so much more to tell let me just let me just shine a light on this whole kind of amazing journey from from right back to when you were younger in days of recruitment to then moving all the way to now where we are in Trink here in the UK, health coaching, podcasting, stay whole. Talk to me about stay whole. Now you're I think about 50 episodes in. Things have gone very deep. You've had some amazing people come on. The production is on point. And what do you think Stay Whole had done has done for you in terms of your, your personal growth? Like what are the, maybe you can openly speak about this. What are the mistakes you think you made with Stay Whole at the start? What are the mistakes you're making now? Maybe we all, we all make mistakes, right? What would you say about that in the last few years? I think the biggest mistake I've made with Stay Whole is not switching the camera on earlier. Yeah. And what I mean by that is just start doing it from day one. Yeah. Just the, the the and you know we we, we talk about this in coaching and, and you do as well the procrastination mm. the distractions yeah. the I need to do this first I need to do that is that you know um you know uh, uh, important urgent you know that is those it's, it's that matrix yeah so I think just not just doing it 
just doesn't matter what format it was. Yes. So that was the number one thing because I procrastinated for a lot. Um, so that has been that has been the, the, one of the biggest m- mistakes, and I probably would would go back and change that. Um, how it's transformed and how it's impacted me. I think it 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 kind of for me. I talk we talk I talked about the North Star earlier, and I think it was almost like, well, if I really want to genuinely do the things that I'm genuinely passionate about and I really I feel meaningful to me, then it's not going to be working for someone else. And I didn't I never seen myself as an entrepreneur or a business person or someone. And I know friends who started loads of business, multiple businesses. And if that, I'm just like, how do you do this? Like, how can you have just oh I just thought that oh, that business not any, I'm doing this now. And I'm just like, I don't I, that was always a, a mystery to me. It still is to a to a degree. But so I was like, oh, how do I how do I make this work? But I thought and I knew, but again, deep down I was like, there's something here that I know is right. There's something that yeah. I, I should be doing is 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 this, is something to do with this. So it kind of gave me a, again that just that guiding uh, light. And I thought, well, I came up with the name Stay Whole because I just felt that we're all we, uh, I don't like using this term now. And I started using the term, but I don't like using it. But I remember at the time thinking, well, I've been quite broken in my life. Yeah, yeah. And I've always tried to bring my bat self back to being whole. Yeah, no, I get that completely. Yeah, yeah. so I just feel like, and I, and I feel like everyone's got something in their life that's probably broken using that, you know, yeah. just using those terms. And, and I want to help people to just stay whole and just get back to being whole. Yeah. And I felt that through food, the food that we eat, of course. And again, I've mentioned my transformation through that and the journey I've been on with nutrition. And I just feel like there's such a power in, and you know, the famous quote from Hippocrates and all of these things. So yeah, yeah. the food is definitely a, a pillar there as well. So I need to include that movement of course is a, is a big, big part of what I've, what I've done in my life. So of course there's going to be a big movement part. So there's eat, there's live, uh, there's move. And then um, I've got the live, my live pillar is about is just, living your life the way that you want to live again this comes from the conversations that i would have in Nisha. It's like yeah. what is it that we want to do we want to tr- and even now we have still have these same conversations and we're doing life book and, and you know, all part of that's going to be it's amazing we want to be overseas we want to be doing things we want to be traveling and, and so we still have so for me so living is living your life the way you're meant to be managing stress you know having connections with with, yes. with people friendships you know love all of those things so i thought let me try and bring all of these together into and again it was just going to be a blog at the time i didn't know it was going to become a podcast and and, and a youtube channel eventually but so that was kind of the 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 principal thinking behind it um just to bring everything that i do together in in one into one space and it's a beautiful summary of really all of the challenges and struggles that you face like right back from when you were a child and you had the weight issues and you went and learned significant amounts about nutrition and then you know the journey into recruitment consultant as a personal trainer and then of course even further living the connection with anisha the meaning and purpose finding having a child having lily like that's the that's the live pillar so actually it's, it's just a great uh, metaphor for literally the whole podcasts and your whole life story okay well i asked this question to quite a few people so bear with me here it's a it's a it's a big one and the answer might not be clear straight away but bear with me the most wonderful thing i think about the world we're in today is that we have the beautiful benefit of the archives of these recordings and the podcasts and you know capturing this moment what do you think is the legacy that you would like to leave what, that you as Sunjay and also stay whole? What's the legacy that you would like to leave? Let's say 50 years time and your, you, you know, kids or grandkids or whoever is, is looking back and they're listening to this episode and you, you share your, you share your legacy. I, I always find this question quite hard. I mean, I'm sure everyone does. Yeah, they do. Yeah. I, I don't see, I'm not trying to put things out there to tell people what to do. Yeah. Right. So I'm not, and I know it sounds strange coming from someone who's a coach and the personal trainer and all of these things, because people think that's what you do, but I don't believe that's what we do. Mm. I don't believe we're there to tell people what to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
So I don't feel like my legacy is like, oh, look at me, do what I do. This is going to change your life and you're going to be amazing because, you know, we, we've all got struggles and I've still got struggles. We, we all have them. So what's my legacy? So I think I just want to show that I I tried. Yeah. I, 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 I suffered and I came through it and this is how I did it and this is the journey that I've been on and I want to look back and think, yeah, I I. I did it. I li- and just you know have that conversation with with my gut on the deathbed, and just give my give it a fist bump and say, "Yeah, we did it, mate." I did my best. That's yeah, such a, uh, that's such a beautiful sentiment, and um, you know it's been such a wonderful conversation. We've actually, you know, I'm thinking about all these things that, that we can bring together, and it just resonates with with a book um, that I, I've spoken about quite a bit, but it's a very profound book, and it's called The Four Agreements. And one of those agreements is I do my best. The others are things like I keep my word, which you spoke about being on that circle line, not keeping your word, saying that you come to meetings, to then becoming someone of much more integrity. Um, not taking things personally is another one. We again spoke about that with um, the people pleasing stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, it's and, and not assuming is the last the last agreement and we again we spoke about we spoke about how we can get caught in assumptions that something is going to make us happier like the motorbike or the cars or the speakers we just assume that that's what society tells us actually i think again the stay the stay whole with eat move live and then the agreements is kind of where you are right now like all of these agreements you're keeping to yourself you have any closing statements or closing words i mean I don't even think I've begun yet. It's yeah. just the funniest. This, 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 <laughs> I really don't even think I've started yet. And it's, you haven't. You haven't. And and you know, the, I remember the thirty year, twenty nine, thirty year old me thinking, "Don't be daft. You can't become a personal trainer at twenty nine, thirty. And then I look back and think, "Wow, look at all, all the things I did." And now I'm thinking, "Don't be daft. You can't start a podcast at forty and yeah. start a YouTube channel at forty three and you know start coaching and go on this transform. Yeah, you can. Why not? And and again, I've looked to other people that have done it. I've looked, you know, I talk about him all the time. But Rich Roll, one yes. of my biggest mentors and you know favorite people, you know, which Anisha doesn't like me saying. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, just you know, his life was at forty, he transformed, and he's now. So so uh, you know, there's loads of people doing it. So for me, yeah, I just feel like I haven't even started yet, but I'm really excited. I'm really excited. And that's all you can ask for, isn't it? That's literally all you can ask for, to be kind of happy where you are, but also excited about your future. That is, you know, that is basically the uh, the blueprint for a meaningful life. Um, both that that beautiful mix of, of being happy in the now and having a positive vision. And I want to just say one thing as well. I want to, you asked me a question earlier, and I'm going to give you another answer. One, you know, what would I say to my self yeah. you know, all those years ago? Yeah. I think, well, the other thing I would say, apart from listening to your gut, is enjoy the moments yes because i i look back and i think in my personal training career no matter i did enjoy it but i felt like i was always trying to go towards a destination Mm. i always felt like oh when i get this then i can look back i can start enjoying myself then i'll be happy yeah like just when i was started working oh when i get the house when i get the car when i get this then i'll be happy rather than enjoying the process and i didn't enjoy the process of achieving those things I wasn't fulfilled with the work but with my personal training work it was something that I genuinely didn't did enjoy but I felt like I look back in those moments where I think you really didn't enjoy it and and now today like days like today literally I'm sitting you know behind that camera whether it's in Southampton whether it's here and I'm just telling myself there is only now and yeah you are now you are doing what you want to be doing yeah and 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 that what brings so much fulfillment to my life. And I think if I could have had that same attitude then, you know, it would have just, yeah, things would have been a bit different maybe. And, you know, it's 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 an amazing thing, hindsight, but you got it now. And I can't tell you, it's exactly the same thing. I have this, you know, this morning when I rolled out of bed at 5.30 to come here, I, I was happy. I was happy to do that. I wasn't pre-booing. I was so excited and ready to to come and have a great day filming with you and what a day it's been and yeah i completely i completely hear you on that enjoy the process it's a cliche phrase but god how many of us miss out on that how many of us you know miss 
a great joke that our child says or a moment of, of deep connection and conversation, we, we so often miss it, you know, and I think it's, it's a, it's a real sign of the times. It's, a, it's an absolute sign of the times. And if you want to be successful nowadays, that's the new rich, you know, the presence, enjoying the process, being literally here and now people have been saying this for years, but I think with, with, our wants and needs being so uh, publicly broadcasted, it's it's very easy nowadays to be looking forward and not and not looking back. And I want to thank you because you know in the last two years, yeah. I mean the last six months, but the last two years has been you know, you know COVID, all this stuff. Lockdown was a blessing. I got my pocket, but I think you know you've since meeting you as well, it's been a big, big shift in, in, in my beliefs and my, my mindset. And, and just that, you know, that, that feeling that there are other people out there yeah. who resonate, who are on the same vibrations, who, absolutely, you know, so I think, you know, you've been a big part of that to make me, to make me believe again. And, and I think, and, and just, yeah. And just thank you for that. Yeah. That means the world. And it's been hundred percent my pleasure. And I thank you as well, because, you know, when I was in going through a serious transition point in my life, I, I moved away from everything I knew in terms of my social circle and my friends. And I, I didn't, I didn't have any kind of company. I was, I was so deep in family and work that I didn't make time to go and see friends. hundred percent truth be told. I'd be doing my personal growth. I'd be doing my life assessments every week and every month. Um, my friend one, even though I knew it was so important and so powerful, it, 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 it was low. The score was low until I met. And interestingly enough, you through the podcast, another one of my good friends through a podcast guy who we'll be meeting on, yeah. on Saturday, both of you guys, um, completely transformed that for me. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a hell of a journey. And, and like I say, we are literally just getting started. Oh, yeah. this, this is the thing. Is the um, so this is the, this is the exciting thing. I have to remind myself of that, um, that we're, I'm only one year into the business and I'm only a few years into this personal growth journey, although it feels like it's been a long time, it's actually not really that long. Um, so yeah it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for asking me because i love interviewing and I, and I absolutely love interviewing you because sometimes i think some of the podcasts out there and it's great to hear you know if someone's sawn their arm off whilst going into a cliff but it's not relatable is it but when someone says that they're sitting in their couch and they're looking at their possessions or when someone talks about relationships splits and decisions about moving country these are all things that we've experienced in one form or another and um yeah i think that's the point of storytelling that's the point of podcasting yeah. and i think you know, the other thing to say there is that <clears throat> had these cameras not been on had this microphone not been here we would have the same conversation and, and we know this because we've so many times we've had a conversation we've said i wish there was a microphone in front of us right now so that again is another sign of, of just 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 that genuine um connection and just yeah just being able to be, be oneself and i think that's amazing thank you completely agree with you completely agree amazing